So we're going to conclude today by revisiting the importance of geology. And we spent a lot of time this morning talking about site characterization and all the things we need to do to make sure that we're getting the correct engineering properties of the materials at our site. Um, we're going to take a, a step back and, and that, again, that big picture approach and just think about um, how much of our site and the design characteristics and uh, things we need to look like look at come from the geology. Um, one of the big things that we know is if you go through the case histories or you think about the performance issues at existing sites, the majority of them, the, the issues are geologic. So having that really, really solid base understanding of the site geology and, and how it's going to impact your site is vital. Um, so the learning objectives for this presentation, which will be brief, again, the role of the engineering geologist, um, identifying the unique considerations of soil and rock foundations, and looking at those geologic considerations and why they're crucial to all scales and all phases of your embankment design and construction. The quote that you'll hear thrown around a lot is up to 70% of all dam issues are related to adverse geological and geotechnical foundation conditions. And again, those are going to take any form of performance issue um, all the way up to failure. So look at your case histories, take the time to attend if you have access to them, the monthly case history uh, program. Those are really great for looking at problems that have happened at other projects. This is one of my favorite quotes. This is by Charles Berkey. He's considered the father of engineering geology. So for the geologists in the room, are there, I missed the introduction this morning. Are there any geologists in the room? We have a few. Okay, awesome. So you guys probably already know all about Berkey. Um, he said, dams must stand, not all of them do, and there's all degrees of uncertainty about them. Reservoirs must hold water, and there's many ways by which water may be lost. The whole structure must be permanent, and the work has a right to be done within the original estimates. Not all of them are, and there's many reasons for their excessive, for their failure or excessive cost, but most of them are geologic. So when we're thinking about geology, we think about scale, and I covered a lot this morning on more of the technical details of starting with that te regional tectonic setting and working our way in, um, looking at those factors. And for this presentation, I wanted to focus it into the importance of geology to uh, for your site or you know what's in it for me. So when we're thinking bigger scale, the major geologic impacts to your site are going to have to do with the dam site location, where we actually put that alignment, the selection of the dam type. Certain dam types are not going to be feasible given certain types of geology. Um, we're also looking at the geologic site model. Um, other big impacts would be the reservoir operation and hazards to that thinking about how much water may be lost. Maybe we're building our dam in a karstic environment. Um, all of that is going to play into the reservoir op operation potentially. There are dams in, in the country and around the world that don't hold water. And often that's related to a geologic issue. Uh, maybe that, that dam is serving as an awesome recharge basin for your groundwater system. And we've definitely seen that happen. Um, big picture geology impacts are going to be the locations of our pertinent structures. We need to put our spillway in a location. Perhaps we're blasting it into rock. It needs to be in a location where we're not going to lose the spillway the first time we operate it because the, the geology and the, the um, site materials are too uh, susceptible to erodibility. Of course, we're thinking of finding those borrowed materials, the dam foundation design, our hazards during construction. Is there going to be a big rockfall issue while I'm trying to blast out for my spillway? We have to mitigate that. A lot of times there's going to be a lot of temporary construction costs related to site personnel safety during construction. And maybe those are going to be uh, features that can be turned permanent, but often these would be temporary features that are going to remain temporary features just for construction. So those costs will have to be built into your design and specifications related to um, site safety because of those geologic hazards. Foundation treatment, we didn't talk, cover that a lot this morning, but this is something that you'll have to, again, be thinking about. It'll go in your specifications and it's going to go into your drawings. Um, a, a lot of drawing packages, you'll see typical foundation treatment details. Um, if I encounter um, discontinuities near the surface or at the base of my excavation, and it's a, this width or, or whatever, you're gonna give these quantifiable type of specifications and details for how to treat that, that bedrock. 
And as we narrow our scale, we talked about this a lot this morning, so I'm not going to touch on it too much here. But again, the site geology is going to be your primary influence for all of these engineering properties that are going to be vital to your design and the construction of your facility. So this is basically the summary of this entire presentation. But your engineering geologists are integral members of the design team um, from the initial planning phase all the way through the project to the completion of construction. And then, of course, beyond the completion of construction, because we normally spend a few years after we're done constructing a, a project, finalizing that construction documentation, making sure everything is recorded well for posterity so that a risk analysis team 20 years from now can come back and say, oh, look, they did all of this. I don't have uncertainty anymore about the foundation treatment or look at all this great dental grouting they did or dental concrete. Uh, you want those records to be there because otherwise that team 20 years down the road is going to say, we have uncertainty. We don't, we don't have the records of what they did. You could have done very, very great uh, foundation acceptance and, and um, treatment, but it has to be recorded. Um, again, looking at that big, big picture, that initial look of our, of our dam site, the first thing where geology is going to become very relevant is placing the dam and locating it. Uh, we, at this point, have already likely developed our death study and our hy working hypothesis of the geologic model, and we're continuing to refine it. So in this example, I have a, a topo map, and I've colored in the current alignment of the river channel. Um, I'm starting to look at some of these features and how maybe they've formed over time. I've drawn in this proposed embankment footprint um, and what that alignment looks like. And so the next thing that we're really starting to consider is all of these geologic impacts to this proposed structure. I see a number of terraces stepping down. This is a hard rock abutment uh, where the previous river configuration has incised into the canyon. And then it's, it's still, it's laterally eroding into the canyon and it's deepening as it goes. And so we see a series of terraces likely maybe very high intensity events that would cause the creation of the next terrace. Um, I'm concerned about valley stress relief jointing. I'm looking at the regional joint pattern I'm already familiar with because of my desktop study. Um, I'm looking at that as it's relevant to the orientation of the dam. Um, I, I'm now seeing instances of upstream to downstream discontinuities potentially. I'm also thinking about my construction safety. Those are some pretty steep cliff faces along those terraces. Um, so those are just some examples of things as you're planning for a new site alignment. Be, be very cognizant of the all the available geologic information and how that's going to impact your constructability um, and, and other items that are going to be important to the design, such as, am I going to get positive seepage cutoff in this abutment that has a severe jointing, perhaps? Uh, so as we're going through and we're identifying and documenting all of our ge geology, we're doing this for multiple purposes. It's, it's not just that we're looking for adverse geologic conditions, which, of course, we are. We, we know of the dangers of not properly capturing those. Um, but, of course, we're also looking to characterize all the engineering materials at the site so that we can use them for construction. Soil foundations, uh, this is something we're going to deal with for most of our embankment dams. Dams tend to be positioned along a valley bottom um, or a topographic low-lying area. Um, these are often along existing drainages because dams are built over rivers. Um, so in some way or another, even for a, a you know an incised canyon, we're still going to be dealing with soil type environments. And, and maybe we're going to be stripping a lot of that out, um, but not necessarily. Um, perhaps we're just looking for a seepage cutoff trench and the rest of the embankment is going to be constructed on that soil foundation. Um, so again, I won't go back to a lot of things that were talked about in the first presentation about understanding our geologic and our geomorphic models. Um, but this is where we, we want to make sure that the geologist is in the room, and that you have a lot of care taken to understanding that soil foundation and all the or, you know, all of the variability that we would likely encounter. For rock foundations, there's a lot of susceptibilities here, especially if we're building an embankment dam on the rock itself or um, in a location where the rock is quite near the surface. We are thinking about concerns related to seepage and internal erosion. We're thinking about concerns related to differential settlement and embankment cracking due to the steep rock foundations. Um, we're thinking about our stability issues because of perhaps uh, weak zones in the bedrock. And then we're also thinking, of course, for rock cavities. This might be something like 
karstic environments that are naturally forming, but we also want to look at mining. There's a lot of projects that are built in the vicinity of existing mines and other um, human activities, so be especially cognizant of that. Uh, there's a project in Colorado that has been on fire for over 100 years now, and it's an old coal mine that the project is built. It's built over the abutment where, the, where there's a coal mine, um, but the, the coal mine has been on, on fire. And so there's areas of the project that are very hot, even on inspections today. So there's some really interesting things. You never know what you're going to find at some of these existing projects. But if you're scouting that project um, for a new structure and, and you found out this used to be an old coal mining area, there's a lot of things popping in my mind immediately about the potential for um, human-made you know, openings, large, large cavities in the ground, um, and maybe even other types of hazards, such as underground fires. Which that wouldn't be the first thing that pops in my mind, but it's still very interesting that this dam abutment has been on fire for a very long time. Um, also, you know, we're in, in bedrock, we're especially thinking about seepage. Um, we're thinking of the potential for sinkholes, potentially. Depends on the type of rock. If you're in a limestone environment, definitely. Um, a few more items that we're thinking about with rock foundations, especially as we're placing an embankment through this this rock canyon, uh, we're really paying attention to the rock mass, the discontinuities in it, and all of the orientations and locations of fault zones and shear zones. And this doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be an active fault zone. These can be um, historic or pre-caternary type uh, features that are still possibly pro um, problematic to your structure. Uh, all of these discontinuities have the opportunity to be in contact with your dam. So you've just designed this beautiful Ge you know, geotechnical structure, um, but we're ensuring that the bedrock has been treated appropriately so that we don't have the opportunity for scour um, or, or other types of um, erosive action on our embankment. Um, these pictures are from Camera Dam, and this was a, an incident where in the left abutment of the dam, um, and that is shown on the left photo here at the top. Let me get my pointer. Uh, this was the as mitigated left abutment. As they were going through, they did realize that there was a stability issue with this rock wedge right here. And this was considered more to be a construction safety issue. So there was a major mod during the dam construction where they've provided some additional um, excavation and they've built a large concrete structure to stabilize this rock wedge. Um, what was unknown at the time um, is, was the true extent of the shear zone that had been encountered. So where the team, they did conduct three additional drill holes near the base of this abutment. Um, one is shown here. What they saw was that this shear feature that they thought was destabilizing this rock block was pinching out. And so the assumption was that our soil-like shear zone is shaped about like this. It's a nice, it's a, it's a small wedge. So they did provide that additional excavation. They've grouted in there to stabilize the material and they stabilize the wedge. In reality, this is a, a schist. Um, well, it's a borderline. It's a, it, there's a, uh, th this is a zone where it's right on the margin of where you have igneous rock and where there is a heat contact that causes metamorphism. Um, so there's a, a, a bit of a, a schist in this formation um, right at the location. We're kind of near the boundary though, where it's moving to more competent. Um, igneous material, so they call it a migmatite, or partially metamorphosed igneous rock. Um, schist is famous for all sorts of things, foliations and, and a lot of other problems. Um, they, the, the, I forget the word that they use, but this kind of sausage-like effect is not uncommon for weathering um, in this type of rock if you have a zone like this. So in fact, that soil-filled discontinuity zone projected all the way up the abutment. It was, it's a 30 degree dip of the rock. This abutment slope was about 30 degrees. So we're following the dip slope. Um, so again, here's those three borings that were conducted that identified that the material is pinching out. Um, however, within two years of the dam being constructed, internal erosion and removal of those materials, also um, excessive uplift pressures, was able to completely destabilize that rock wedge. The rock wedge was removed the concrete dam was fine. The concrete dam would have would have uh, stood there in perpetuity, 
um, but it, the abutment completely failed. And this is an odd example where there was some combination of internal erosion and uplift. And ultimately, uplift is, was considered to be the contributing factor to the failure. Um, but this is just another idea. This was a concrete dam, but it's not uncommon to also have embankment dams in these type of rock environments. So just because you're on rock doesn't necessarily mean you're immune to all of those different types of failure modes. I wanted to give a little bit more detail as well about geologic mapping and the process. And this is a reference that you have for later as well. Um, you, you know, mapping is a, is a quite, uh, it's a complex investigation. You're going to, of course, identify your primary purpose of map, mapping. You're going to determine a lot of factors such as the accuracy required, precision required, um, and all those sort of things as you're going through and compiling. And I, I don't want to go through this whole thing, um, but there's a lot of factors that goes into your field mapping. Um, you, you're going to start, of course, with your raw field data. You're going to use that to inform your preliminary investigations. And then that preliminary data is going to be used for uh, putting together final data. And the presentation of this field mapping is one of your most important products because that's what's going to be used in every report in the future and it's going to be referenced by every design uh, memoranda that you put out. So make sure that a lot of time and accuracy is put into that final mapping product. All right, another consideration when we're thinking about the geology and its importance to your, importance to your site would be, of course, considering the material that's going to be suitable for construction. And if you put your geologist in the room with your geotech in the room and the other folks, the geotech might say, I need a filter with this type of gradation. And the geologist might say, well, I have some fluvial deposits. I have a, there's a glacial deposit over there. You know, I know there's some alien materials. And you have to work together to, to get to that common language of with the suitability for all these different types of materials given the depth structural environment to your construction site. Um, there's a significant cost savings to source your material as local as possible. And this picture is from um, a case study you're going to hear from later this week at Isabella Dam. Um, and they go through a, a lot of great examples of that material handling. Um, another awesome thing that your geologist will do for you is uh, potentially look at fault investigations, especially the potential for an active fault. Um, this is also from Isabella. Isabella is a, a very all-encompassing project. It has a little bit of everything. So it does feature an active fault. Um, in this example, uh, you can see some of the trenching that was done to characterize that fault. And ultimately, what this is providing for the design is how much displacement do we expect to see? What's the orientation of the displacement? And therefore, how does the designer need to modify the design? And so they're going to talk about that later this week. And um, ultimately, the decisions were made to, say, the filter thickness and items like that. And just some that's great photos, uh, great figures. I think the Isabella team did a, a really excellent job of, of reporting all their findings. So from design to construction, understanding geology is vital. Uh, when we're designing, the geologist is answering questions like this for your team members, um, possibly uh, giving enough information and characterization of your material to answer, do we have to excavate this material? Can we treat it? Or is it going to be suitable to be left in place? What do we know about the soil permeability? What do we know about the existing potential for settlement of the foundation given maybe field observations? Um, the rock weathering is, a, is a, going to be a huge item. Rock permeability, shear zones, excavation hazards. These are all questions that the whole team will be working together to answer, um, but make sure that we're, we're getting from our knowledge of the geology. During construction, we're also looking to identify and treat geologic features as they emerge. As you're excavating to that final foundation grade, you're going to come across items that will likely have to be treated. Uh, connecting the potential for grouting and how we would even specify that grouting to the geologic feature. So what do we know? When you're going through and writing the specifications, you're going to have to answer all sorts of questions about the discontinuity sets. How much grout are they going to take? How open are they? Where do we need to grout? How you know, do we need to angle some of these features to reach the discontinuities of interest? Stabilizing excavations, mapping things as they're exposed, thinking critically about connecting our instrumentation to those geologic features of interest, and developing really, really good as-built documentation of our geologic features. Because again, you don't want your team to be looking at your project that you did a really good job on 20, 50 years from now in a risk analysis and say, I don't see this documentation. I now have uncertainty that this ever even occurred. This is just a, an example of some photogrammetric 
uh, mapping that was done in the field for a final excavation grade. I am a huge proponent of photogrammetric, photogrammetric foundation mapping. Uh, you can go out, collect the images by UAV. That is a prefer, you know, it's definitely preferable, especially for a large project. It's fast. And then you can go back to the office. Um, you can actually very quickly print some of these images and go out and hand map directly on your images. Um, you, or you can develop your mapping product and then later trace it on. There's a lot of options, but this is uh, renders a 3D model of your site where you can have all of your mapped, mapped product draped on the 3D image. And it's pretty amazing for things that we might be able to use down the road with it. Imagine being able to put on your AR or VR headset and go walk around the original final excavation grade of your site. Like later there's a, there's a weird seepage area or some soft spot has emerged. And if you really could just go and have the lens into a different time when you had all that open, well, that would, that'll be possible by collecting this type of data now. If anyone wants to talk about AR or VR and dam engineering, I'm all about it. I think there's a lot of possibilities there but down the road. Uh, this is another image, just a reminder, clean up the foundation when you're doing your geologic mapping. That's, uh, that'll definitely always happen. Make sure it's written clearly in the specification though, because as the geologist and the geotech engineer, we know this very clearly, but we need to set the expectations um, very qu quantitatively for the contractor when you're writing those documents. All right, another thing to think about is the future geologic impacts at the site. Um, if we do a really good job now of documenting our geologic information, it might be useful in helping to explain anomalous operation uh, in the future and aiding in those planned remediations. So a few takeaways from the beginning of design to the end of construction and beyond the end of construction. The geologist is there to help identify foundation issues at all stages. I know it says prior to design, but at all stages, we're looking at that. Uh, we know that investigations should be directed to address our key foundation concerns and identify things like our borrow areas. So we have the hazard side, we also have the, the use, how this material will be used side. And those are investigations that are likely occurring at all phases of the project. Um, always think about your geologic mapping. It's going to continue into construction. We likely had a lot of geologic mapping up front to get our surface materials to identify borrow areas to help identify that dam alignment. And during construction, we have a whole different set of mapping. So understand that's why if you go back and revisit that slide, it has a really great detailed flow chart of considerations for mapping. It does apply to all different stages of, of geologic field mapping. Um, so I do think that's a great figure to revisit. You never really know what you have until you open up the big test pit, which is the excavation for your project. And at that point, the specs are written and the dam is designed. So be flexible and be able to respond to those changing conditions in the field. Uh, a few acknowledgments, some of the slides were stolen from Keith Kelson and Susie Hespertel. All right, that's all I have. Are there any questions about how awesome and important geology is?